Okay, so again, good morning everyone. Welcome to APNIC eLearning Web Class. We do conduct eLearning sessions every Wednesday. So today, the 6th of April in 2016, we will be discussing mostly about IPv6. So we have three different sessions, but the main topic that will be covered for all of them is on IPv6. Now we will start with this session that will run for one hour, and it's called IPv6 Overview. So I guess from the title alone, you can see that this is an introductory um, session for IPv6. We will learn a lot of things about this, but before I go on to the details of that, I just would like to introduce myself very briefly. Now, my name is Cheryl Hermoso. I work as a training officer for APNIC. Now, APNIC, as you might have heard of, is Asia Pacific Network Information Center. We are the regional internet registry for the Asia Pacific region. As such, our main function is to distribute IP addresses. So it only makes sense for us to educate members and non-members alike about IPv6 protocol. So um, as I've said, my name is Cheryl. Um, these are the specialties that I'm kind of involved with. So we have other topics as well with our face-to-face um, -face or e-learning sessions. We have network security, IPv6, of course, DNS and DNSSEC, and internet resource management. Now, this session runs for one hour, and at the end of the session, I will be asking you to fill in a very short survey for me. So please try and do that. I will post the link towards the end of the class. Now, let's start with um, an overview. What are we going to learn for the next one hour? So these are the things that we will be looking at. What exactly is IPv6? What how can you explain IPv6 better? And the best thing would be to look at the protocol background, the motivations behind IPv6, what are the differences between IPv6 and IPv4? Why do we need IPv6 where we already have IPv4 in place, right? Um, as such, we will also be looking at some new functional improvements. What are the changes? What are the new features that have been implemented for IPv6? We will look at a new functionality called extension headers in IPv6. We will have a short comparison of both the IPv4 and IPv6 headers. Look at each of the fields in both v4 and v6 to know their main differences. And then lastly, how can you get IPv6? How can it be distributed from the RIR to the LIRs and downstream once you are sure that you want to have your IPv6? So that's what we're going to cover for this session. Now, the first part is, it, of course, to understand what exactly is IPv6. Before you go on and implement this on your networks, it is important that you understand very clearly why it's important for you. IP, as you know, okay, most of you probably have um, some understanding of how the internet works, what are different network protocols, and things like that. So one very important thing when it comes to networks is IP, Internet Protocol. So IP is a pillar that supports the Internet today. That's how you forward packets, how you forward data from one node to another node from a source to a destination. What you need here is to be able to forward data given logical addresses, which is what we know as IP addresses. So from one IP address, which is your source, you will be able to forward these packets going to your destination, which has a destination address, passing through different nodes or network devices, right? They will be able to forward or route your packets across because you know what is the destination address of the packet itself. That, in short explanation, it kind of describes what IP is. Now, currently, the version of IP that we are using is IPv4. Right? With IPv4, your source destination addresses are using IPv4 addresses. What is IPv4? It comprises of 32-bit address, okay, so a total of 2 raised to 32, about 4.3 billion possible addresses um, that you can use for all your devices. So devices that need to send and receive messages from the network will need to have an IPv4 address. right? So currently, as I said, what we're using is IPv4. Now here, we are introducing a new version of IP called IPv6. Now when I say new in this sense, 
um, as later on you will see in the next few slides that when I say new, it's not exactly new. That's because IPv6 has been available for quite a while now. Okay, if you can remember IP or basically the internet started in around 1970s, it became really popular in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And as you know, now we have millions of devices that are connected to the internet. So um, the thing is, um, with, 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 with that um, concept, right, um, you need to have an IP address for each device so that it will be reachable. Now, as the network grows, okay, you have more devices, therefore you need more IP addresses to cater for that, right? So that's why IPv6 was introduced because first and foremost, the uh, space for IPv4, the address space for IPv4 will not be enough if we continued with the distribution processes that's happening in the early days. So when I say new, and in here when I, with IPv6, you will see the standard was actually implemented in around 1998. And even years before that, they were already discussing about IPv6. So in that sense, it's not exactly new at all. The only difference is, right now, we have reached a point where it seems we really don't have much of a choice if we want our network to grow, but to implement IPv6 so that it can be okay, used to assign to the rest of our network devices, right? So the protocol in itself is not exactly new. It's been around for a while, okay? Now, I have a lot, a lot of people asking me about IPv5. So I guess this is just a curious question. So we have IPv4, we have IPv6. What happened to IPv5? So it's not really that important, okay? But just to satisfy everyone's curiosity, IPv5 is an experimental protocol. It's called Internet Stream Protocol. It was never standardized. It's RFP 1190. Um, but to avoid confusion, okay, to um, the experimental protocol and what we now have as IPv6, we renamed it as different, right? But it was never standardized. Therefore, it will never be used for your devices um, by, say, by vendors or manufacturers. Now, another thing, um, if you are going to look for materials about IPv6, the best way is to not look for IPv6 per se, but look for a name called IPNG. That's because IPv6 was previously called, okay, during its infancy period as IP Next Generation. So during the early development stage, when they were discussing about possible protocols, what should be included in this standard, it was called as IPNG. This is a bit of a protocol background in IPv6. As I said, it's not really very new at all, and this one supports it. It started in around 1990, 1992, when a few guys in IETF, IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, that standardized um, um, all of these um, protocols. So it was discussed in IETF that if they continued the distribution process that they're doing in IPv4, they will not have enough. So just a brief background of that. When you say distribution process, so if you need an IP address, it has to be okay, distributed to you, right? You have to ask for it. Um, if you want it to be reachable on the internet, you need to have a public IPv4 address, right? So I'm sure everyone understands that. Now, how do you get your IPv4 address? Now, originally at the start, there's just like this, um, well, pretty much group of people. It's a very small network, ARPANET. So you have a guy that distributes them, okay? And then you just list down all of that. And the matter of distribution is very large. Some of them are class A addresses, okay? Later on, it was a class B addresses. So if you're familiar, that's class full addressing. So in some sense, if you look at it now, class full addressing is very wasteful. For example, if I need to assign IP address to about 100 machines in my network, I have a very small network, so I only need 100 IPv4 addresses. Now, if it's class full addressing, the smallest class that can be given to me is a class C. A class C can have how many IP addresses? 256, okay? 256, so you have 254 
devices or computers or mainframes okay that can use those IP addresses so if you only need a hundred you're wasting a hundred and fifty four okay now imagine that in the early days you only have about maybe not even 10 machines in a big university or research institution and then you get a class A address a class A will have how many Okay, that's more than 1 million IP addresses that are possible for that range. Right, so it's kind of wasteful if you look at it now. So if you are going to distribute in that sense, they did the mathematics, they did the computation, and they noticed that around 1994 to 1996, okay, with the amount of distribution that was happening then, it will have, okay, the, the IPv4 space will have been exhausted. Okay, now what year are we in now? It's 2016. So we manage to still preserve the IPv4 addresses. And we did a few things there. They looked at two possible um, solutions to that problem of IPv4 exhaustion. One is a short-term solution. The other one is a long-term solution. When they say short-term solution in that sense, they started using classless addressing. So it's no longer classful addressing, it's classless. So you have the flexibility okay, to move from one, uh, from within all those 32 bits, depending on how much address that you need. Another one okay, related to that is implementation of CIDR, right? And we also have, um, from 1992, we have regional internet registries, such as in Phoenix. RARs distribute IP addresses and um, depending on which region you're in, there are policies that the community came up with so that when you request for IP, you have to reach that criteria. It's not as easy as coming to one person and asking, hey, I need a class A, can you give me a class A? It's not like that anymore. If you need an IP address, you have to justify that you actually need them, okay? Usually by using, say, network diagrams and other justifications. So those are short-term solutions. The long-term solution that they looked at is, of course, IPv6. So we have the IPv4 address space. Why don't we introduce another protocol, right, that can cater for a bigger address space, and that is IPv6. So in around 1994 until uh, later, 95, 96, they were discussing this in IDF. There are many different proposals that were sent through, some of them propose to have 64-bit addresses. Some of them 128-bit. Some of them says, let's make it a bit more flexible. Maybe start with 64, but then it can be expanded easily to be um, 128 or maybe even longer. Okay, those are the proposals that were sent through. Now, at the end of the day, at the specification, the very first RFP, which is an RFP 2460, okay, for IPv6, um, now, um, uses 128-bit addresses. Okay, so that's a bit of a background. Do we have any questions from the class about this? All right, now a little bit about IPv4 exhaustion that I talked about in the previous slide. Now this graph shows us, okay, from each RAR, when is the expected exhaustion day? When it's exhausted in this case, what really happens is, so, I'm sure most of you are familiar with IANA. IANA is Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Okay, they maintain all of the number resources, IPv4, IPv6, AS numbers. From IANA, it's distributed to the five regional internet registries around the world. So there are five, AFRINIC, APNIC, RIPENCC, ARIN, and MACNIC. So if you notice from this graph, this is around the time when Okay, each of the RIR have exhausted their IPv4 space. So where is APNIC? APNIC is the blue line there. Okay, so this is we one, meaning we have the final facet. So when IANA reached okay, the five last slash eight addresses, they distributed it um, equally among the five RIR. So each RIR gets its own last slash eight. So since around this time, 2013, APNIC, so in our region, we have already started distributing 
from the finals slash it. Now, what happens if we've used up all of that slash it? Okay. There is no more IPv4 address in our region. Okay, we can possibly do a bit of transfers between regions, but we can no longer get another IP block from IANA. Okay, so IANA distributed to the RAR. RARs now distribute that to local internet registries, service providers, enterprise organizations, such as your companies. Right? So, um, when we say that IPv4 is now exhausted, okay, it doesn't mean right now, at this point, that we no longer have IPv4. However, if you look at IANA, there is now zero okay, ad uh, addresses, IPv4 addresses, in its pool. Now, all the five RIRs have their last slash it. In our region, we have started giving from that final slash it. And right now, 2016, I think we are around 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, okay, of that last final slash it. Okay, so if you, you can also look at the others, okay, when they have started reaching this, um, this line here, which is one. So this one is Aaron. They reached that in middle or middle or early 2014 and things like that. You can have a quick look at this. You can also check uh, the link at the bottom to have a more updated version of this graph. All right. Any questions? So that's the reality that we're in right now. So um, what are the motivations behind IPv6? Why do we need this? I guess the very first reason, of course, is the address space. The new IPv6 protocol promises, okay, obviously it has plenty of IPv6 addresses that you can use for many different devices. Now, just a quick calculation over your head. So, how many IPv4 addresses can you have in the IPv4 address pool? It's about 4.3 billion. Now, imagine that each and every person in the globe, okay, in our planet, has their own IPv4 address. Will IPv4 be sufficient for that? The answer is no, because right now we are more than 7 billion in population. Okay, now obviously right now we don't really have one public IP address for each person, but there are many devices um, that it, it's being used by, say, just a single person. You have your laptops, you have your desktops, you have your mobile phones, your iPads, Right? So each of them will need to have their own IP address. Now, another thing is as we grow, right now we have what we call as Internet of Things. Okay? Your, say, uh, your car, your um, home appliances possibly have their own IPv6, IP address as well. They can connect to the Internet so that they can exchange information. Right? If you have a fridge at home, and you want it to tweet about the contents of the fridge, you should be able to do that if it's connected to the internet. And to do that, you must have a public IPv6 or IPv4 address. So these are the things, okay, part of the technical, technical evolution, technological evolution that we have, right? We need to cater for the growth of the internet. And by using IPv6, we can do that. Another one is it's seen as a solution for very complex hierarchical addressing needs which IPv4 is not able to provide us. Now, this has not exactly happened, but the idea was to have a more hierarchical distribution process. Okay, so from the upstream providers, let's say from IANA to the RIR, from RIR to the LIR, from the LIR to the end users, kind of like more hierarchical, so the distribution, you can see it from the IP address, which part will be, or which, um, um, bits will be used for, say, this leg of the distribution. It's not exactly happened, but ideally it was seen as kind of like a solution in the early days. Now, this last, last, uh, third one is very important, end-to-end -end communication without the need of NAT for some real-time application. Now, most of you must be familiar with NAT. NAT is Network Address Translation, okay? So from its name itself, you know that the purpose of a NAT is to um, translate Okay, one address family to another address family or one IP address range to another IP address range. Usually, inside your network, you're using private address, right? Now, if you need to access the internet, it needs to have a public address. 
So in the net box, you have a corresponding IPv4 public address. Usually this one, maybe, or a range of 10 for about 100 or 1,000 different users. So there's no end-to-end -end communication there. And maybe some of you have um, experienced this, that going through NATs can actually um, affect, say, different applications, maybe the reliability or the user experience. If you're using, say, VoIP, VoIP, okay, some of the VoIP applications do not work very well if it needs to pass via a NAT box. So that defeats the purpose of having end-to-end -end communication. Now, if you go back into the early days of the internet, that was really the purpose, right? One machine should be able to connect to another machine, end-to-end -end communication, which if we have IPv6 now, we don't need to have NAT because we have enough IPv6 addresses for all of those machines. Next one here is it ensures security, reliability of data, faster processing and, and of protocol overhead because it uses 64 bits. It has um, IPsec built in um, by default in it and stuff like that. Stable services for mobile networks. Now we, we are kind of like seeing this happening now. You have internet for different airlines, different transport systems, mobile networks, okay, mobile devices are using IPv6 addresses. So it should have support for IPv, uh, mobile IPv6. All right, so um, so those are some of the features, okay? I, I guess uh, just going back to the main ones, okay? The main reason why you would want to implement IPv6 is of course, because of the IPv4 address exhaustion. Now, how much can we get with IPv6? So we said it's much larger than IPv4, but how much really? With IPv4, we said it's, 32 bits, therefore you can have about 2, 3 to 32 possible addresses or about 4.3 billion addressable devices. With IPv6, when you look at the address itself, it uses 128 bits. So that's 2 raised to 128 or 3.4 times 10 to the 38 or 3.4 billion, billion, billion possible addressable devices. So it's not just four times bigger than IPv4. It's actually way, way, way bigger than IPv4 addresses. Okay, so um, aside from that, we have new functionalities that have been added here. The reason for that is because if you remember the TCP IP protocol, it was published in the 1970s, right? Late 1970s. Now when it was, when it was published, it's for ARPANET. They don't have as much experience using okay, um, or exchanging um, protocols or ex sorry, exchanging packets okay, using IP protocol at that time. Now, when they are developing IPv6 protocol, they have some understanding of how it all works. They have experience with IPv4. Therefore, the stuff that they don't want, okay, with IPv4, they decided to remove it. The stuff that are missing there, they decided to implement it. So these are some of the uh, functions and um, features of IPv6. Obviously, the first one that is the address space. So it's increased from 32 bits to 128 bits. Next one, okay, for easier management, we're using stateless auto configuration. Now remember, this was developed around um, 1990. This was just around the same time that DHCP is being developed. You see a lot of like um, similarities between them. So what's the idea behind stateless auto configuration? Now, how do you assign IP address on your, say, computer, on your machine? You can either do it statically or dynamically, right? Now, with stateless auto configuration for IPv6, your machine will have its IP address automatically even before you assign anything into it, right? So the moment that you enable IPv6, it will have an IPv6 address. And that IPv6 address can now be used okay, by that machine, meaning it should now be reachable from other machines belonging to the same network. Okay, We will discuss that a little bit more as we go on. Okay, But that's a very important feature of IPv6.
Now we said that you are now having like better performance when it comes to IPv6 and that's because we are using fixed header size of 40 bytes and we're using 64 bit align. I guess nowadays since most of the machines, switches and um, uh, computers are 64 bit aligned by default, it doesn't really um, have much of a difference with IPv4. But in the early days, when we were still using 32 bit versus 64 bit um, devices, then you see the difference between them, right? And the last one there is no hop by hop segmentation. Here, we are introducing what we call as path MTU recovery. What is that? What is MTU? MTU is maximum transmission unit. Think of it as the width of the road. If you're going to exchange data from, say, network A to network B, okay, you can only send a maximum of whatever is the width of that, uh, of that link or the MTU size for that link, right? You define that on your routers. So in this case, with IPv6, it will try to discover the MTU size or the best MTU for that path from A, network A, the source, up to say the destination which maybe is network B or network E. So all the hops, maybe it has to go to network B, C, D before it arrives to E, they will set their own MTU sizes, right? It can be the default, it can be 1500, but it can also be something that they configured as a custom value. So by using path MTU discovery, even before you send actual packets, you already know okay, that your data will go all the way through. With IPv4, if you're not doing path MTU discovery, what happens usually is you send a packet, it goes to B, goes to C, but then Point C, the link there, they set MTU size to say 1200. So it cannot pass through that, it will be dropped. So you have to reformulate your packets again, okay, refragment, and then send it at a smaller MTU size. So with path MTU discovery, you're trying to avoid that. So the moment that you send your packet, it should go all the way through because you already know the MTU size for that path. All right? Other functional improvements here, multimedia, multitask. Okay, it's very much related to this last one because it's no more broadcast. What do we mean? So in IPv4, we rely heavily on broadcast. Okay, when you want to discover a machine in the network, you send broadcast messages, right? When you try to ping, when you try to send ARP requests, it uses broadcast. Now, this is one thing that's very different in IPv6. We're not using broadcast. Instead, we are using multitask. Okay? Instead of sending it to everyone, we will only send it to a subset of that group that uh, really needs okay, to hear that message. Okay? Mobile IP, I've already mentioned a little bit about this, mobile IPv6. We'll not go to the details here, but essentially this is about uh, triangular routing. You remember in V4, I'd say mo with the typical mobile IP, um, you have triangular routing. Now here we're trying to eliminate that, okay, so that you have a simplified, faster uh, communications between your uh, main um, uh, main agent and all your um, say roaming agents, right? Here we also have VPN. So we talked about security earlier on. Okay, this is how you're implementing security in IPv6. We have IPsec. IPsec is built in by default on IPv6. Actually, it's made to run for IPv6. Because we are taking too long to implement this, okay, they have ported or they have created IPsec as a separate protocol that you can now implement alongside IPv4. Okay, but originally when IPsec was uh, um, being uh, discussed, okay, it was supposed to be just part of IPv6. Okay? We also have QS tagging for um, faster processing. All right, so quite a lot of things that we have discussed there. Okay, um, a few things are very different in IPv4. Things like broadcast, uh, VPN support, okay, um, and mobile IPv6, I guess. Uh, the use of path MTU discovery. They're kind of very different concepts than what we know in the typical IPv4 network.
Now, another one is the, the use of extension headers. So um, you will probably see this later on when you look at the different um, headers for v4 and v6, that in IPv4, you have a lot of fields. Now, in IPv6, we try to eliminate some of those fields. The idea is, if you don't need a certain field, let's remove it. And then the moment that we need it, we will insert it. We will include it, right? So the idea there is for that your router, your network devices will not have to process a lot of fields for a default value that's not really very useful that they're not going to need. So in the sense, we are introducing what we call as extension headers. It's optional. It's added as needed. I'll show you an example. These are the different codes, okay? Hop by hop, ISYNC, TCP, UDP. Now, what does your packet look like? You have a header, you have a payload. That's your IP header and IP payload. Your uh, IP payload, okay, is usually the TCP segments, okay, from the upper layer. So if it's TCP, that's your TCP um, header and the TCP payload. So that means if you have a typical IPv6 um, packet with no extra extension headers, what follows your IP header is your TCP header. So that's what we have here. Say code 6 is TCP, meaning what follows? It's kind of like telling you that there is no extension header. Okay, what follows is now your TCP. Now let's look at a very good example on this case here. So let's look at this diagram. It's a linked listed extension header. So you have this typical IPv6 header that I've already discussed. Okay, in your next header field, in your IP header, it will show you a code 6, meaning what follows is your TCP. If you don't have any extension header, it will look like this. Now consider this next one. Okay, in your IP header, you have a next header of zero. So in the previous slide, zero is hop by hop. Going back here. So now you have an extension header here. It's a hop by hop option header. Okay, and then in here, you also have a field that says next header 44. So what follows is a fragment header. So it's not your IP payload yet. But then here in the next header field, it says that the next one that comes after this is 6, which is your TCP. So this is now your IP payload. So what you're exactly doing here is you're ex um, inserting extension headers between your IP header and your IP payload. It's kind of a linked list. You can have one, you can have none, you can have more than two um, extension headers there. You just insert it. And as long as you can point to that as your next header, that should be all right. Okay, so it's a linked listed extension header. Any question on this? Clear enough? All right. Um, okay, fragmentation handling in IPv6. Let's not go too much detail here because I still have a lot of things to discuss. But essentially, we've looked at path MP discovery, right? So with that, you know that um, to prevent uh, fragmentation in IPv6, you have to discover uh, what is the MPU size for that link first by using path MPU discovery. These are some of the size guidelines for MPU, both for IPv4 and IPv6. The most efficient MPU size to use for IPv6 is 1500. Okay, so just remember that. That's usually set as a default. IPsec, we've already discussed in the previous slides, is a mandatory feature for IPv6. It's part of the IPv6 protocol in itself. It's built in to the protocol. All right, now here, let's look at a comparison between IPv4 and IPv6 headers to understand some of the differences between them in more detail. On the left side here, you can find IPv4 header. And these are the fields in your IPv4 header. We have a legend here, okay, color-coded scheming here, so you know which fields have been the same for IPv4 and IPv6, which fields have been removed, which have been changed, and if there are new fields in IPv6. So let's have a look at them one by one. 
The ones in yellow here are fields that I can get from IPv4 and IPv6. So it's essentially the same field, same function. Version in IPv4 is still version in IPv6. The content will be 0100 for IPv4, so it stands for 4. In IPv6, it will be 0110, so 6, IPv6, right? So you know which IP version you're working on. Source and destination addresses are also still the same. The main difference only is that for IPv4, you have 32-bit source and destination addresses. In IPv6, you have 128-bit source and destination addresses. So the field size is bigger, but the content is the same. It's still your source address and your destination address. Okay, now next one here are the red um, fields that have been removed. So I told you earlier, some of the fields in IPv4, while they're useful, they're not useful in all cases. Maybe sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. So what they did was eliminate all of these fields altogether, okay, so that... Okay, if you need it, you can insert it later on as an extension header. Okay, by doing so, you're simplifying your header, meaning you, your router don't have to take too much time, too much resources trying to figure out or getting each of those fields, okay, and interpreting them. So in IPv6, if you notice, is it's a much simpler header with less fields compared to IPv4. Now, the IPv4 header size is usually um, 10, uh, sorry, 20 octets, 20 bytes, but it can be expanded. That's 20 bytes at the minimum, but because you have, you usually add a lot of things in the options field, it can be longer than 20 bytes, so it's variable. In IPv6, we're keeping it constant to 40 bytes. We have removed all of these um, Okay, like extending um, fields there, okay, that now you can only insert as an extension header. It's not part of the typical IPv6 header, like, uh, like the ones you see on the right side. Okay, so these ones in red have now been removed. If you need them, it can be inserted as an extension header. The ones in light blue here are the ones that have been kept and somehow similar still functions in v4 and v6. Type of service is now traffic path in IPv6. Total length is now payload length in IPv6. Um, hop limit okay, is originally time to live. Okay, and then we have a next player field instead of protocol. Um, total length here in IPv4 is the length of your header and a payload. Okay, um, In IPv6, you only need the length of the payload because the IPv6 header field, after the IPv6 header, the entire IPv6 header is constantly 40 bytes. So you don't really need to compute for it any longer. So you just need to get the length of your data or your payload. Now, time to live has been replaced by top limits in IPv6. What is TPL? Time to live. What is the purpose of a TPL? In TPL, all the packets will have its TPL value so that when it doesn't reach Okay, its destination, what happens is it goes to, hops to different routers across the network, but then it just goes around in blue. Now, if you have time to live, it has an expiration. It will be discarded after a period of time. Now, in IPv6, instead of using timing parameters, we will use hop limits. What is a hop limit? So, it now depends on the number of hops that your packet passes through. Okay, it passes through router A, router B, router C, so that's the number of hops not time in itself. The reason being is that you don't want that dependency in time because there are minute differences from one router to another. If you're using hops, it's always kind of like you know that it's the same, right? We're using hop limit instead of TPL in IPv6. Now the last one here is a new field. It's called flow label. Now type of service and traffic class is used for um, some say filtering or um, QoS, right? Um, priorit prioritization, prioriza prioritizing one type of packet over the other. But it's you have a pre, um, predestined or uh, you, ha you already have like a set of classes, okay, in this case. But with flow label, 
This one is kind of similar to traffic class, except that this is something that you define yourself. You can define different flows. Say you have priority of streaming uh, videos over typical, say, um, data or other types of access to your uh, network, right? So you can define a flow and give priority to that flow over others. That's the purpose of the flow label field here. Okay, so that's pretty much, I think, um, mainly the things that we want to discuss about um, the features, functional improvements, and protocol discussion of IPv6 and some comparison with IPv4. Do we have any questions on this from the class? You all seem to be quiet. Hopefully, you are understanding all of these things that we'll be discussing. Now, um, let's discuss about uh, the actual request space. Now, we will look more into this in detail in the next session, which is IPv6 addressing and submitting. So, if you signed up for that one, that will be at one, I think, uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. So just about an hour from now. So please um, also join us for that one. You can also just log in as guest, as you have, you probably would have done here. That's correct. It's flow label similar to POS and MPLS. It's similar to POS, but not exactly just POS and MPLS. So there's different like implementation of that. But yeah, the idea is the same. Okay, you're defining flows so that you can provide priority for specific types of packets over the others, okay? But here you have, okay, you have more control as opposed to traffic class, okay? Is that clear? Um, I guess if you want to know more about like how POS is done in MPLS, um, well, we don't actually have e-learning for that one yet, um, but we will be providing some in um, the next few months, so please do watch out for that one, all right? Okay, any other questions? Okay, I don't see any um, one typing. So let me just continue here. But so this part is just a very brief discussion of um, how do you get your addresses. So where are we now? So I've said we've given out, um, um, sorry, we, we, we don't have enough IPv4 addresses, but each RIR already have their IPv6 block. So you can actually go to say APNIC um, to request for your IPv6 addresses. What happened is from the entire IPv6 address space, they have a slash three, which is what we call as global unicast address. This can loosely be considered as say similar to um, public address in IPv4. These are publicly uh, reachable addresses, okay? So from this global unicast address, we have the pivoted slash 12s to each of the RIR, okay? So in the IANA reserve, you have 506, you have five that's pivoted to the RIRs and one that's used for other purposes. In our region at APNIC, the block that we've given to us is 2400 slash 12. So if you come and request for your IPv6 address, it would usually fall under this range. So don't be surprised because the bigger block that was given to APNIC is 2400 12. Now what's the next step for you? Here I think it's just the beginning. Of course, try to understand what IPv6 is. Okay, you should have some basic understanding at this point. Now the next step is for you to get your IPv6 block. If you don't have it yet and you are an APNIC member, you can easily get this. Okay, we have a program called Kickstart IPv6. If you are already an APNIC member, you can just log into your My APNIC account and claim your IPv6 address block. If you're new to APNIC, of course, you can always uh, request for IPv6 address, okay, and sign up for mem membership um, at the same time. Okay, so again, I think um, um, you can also check with your organization if you already have IPv6 address and have a look at that address and maybe try to implement it. In the next session, we will be discussing some um, ways to look at these IPv6 addresses, mainly how you can um, plan your network, okay, with, say, if you have an IP slash particle IPv6 block, how can you um, distribute that IPv6 addresses to your network, to your customers, and things like that. We will try to understand that in the next two sessions.
All right. So I guess that's pretty much it for me um, at this stage. Here you can find the current number of prefixes in um, the global routing table when it comes to IP users. There's about 28 to 30, um, a little less than 30,000 BTP entries in the global routing table. This is much, much, much smaller than IPv4. So if you look at cider-report.org, you'll see those statistics. But notice a big improvement, a big increase from 2011 until now, meaning a lot more networks are jumping into and implementing IPv6 in their networks, and that is a real good sign. All right, any questions? Okay, if you want to learn more about IPv6, there is a page in the APNIC website, IPv6 at APNIC, where you can learn a few more things about best practices, depending on what type of network you have. There are case studies that you can find there. And of course, you can always ask for prep training at APNIC.net. Is there only one IPv6 address for my laptop or mobile? Ah, the answer is no. So if you want to learn more about that, I will discuss that in the next session. That means, okay, this is a preview. There are um, different types of IPv6 addresses, and your machine can have more than one IPv6 address. So, say for one network interface, originally in IPv4, you can only have one IP address, right? So, either you assign a local address or you assign a public address for that interface. In IPv6, you can have more. So, to answer your question, no, it's not just one. You can have one or more IPv6 addresses in the same interface. Does that answer your question, Dinesh? Okay. All right, good. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to learn more about which types of addresses, please um, join the next session, which is on IPv6 addressing and submitting at 1 o'clock this afternoon. So that's about an hour from now. So I guess it's the end of our session, guys. Um, thank you very much for joining us. My apologies for starting quite late because we were waiting for a few more participants to join in. Now I have here a feedback form. If you can take a couple of minutes, please click on this link and answer the feedback form. Now the slides are also available if you want them. I'm just gonna quickly grab that link for you. So you can download the um, PDF copies of the materials from this link. All right, so that's the end of our session, everyone. Thank you again very much for your time and your attention. I hope it has been helpful for you and hope to see you in the next e-learning session. Bye-bye.